All right, so um, I'm co-presenting with Pavel here, and uh, we're both from Qualcomm Innovation Center, and we wanted to talk about uh, bringing up LVM and Linux on Hexagon. So, all right, so just wanted to introduce ourselves. I'm Angshu, that's Pavel, and um, I manage the compiler team for the Hexagon DSP. I'll talk a little bit more about the Hexagon DSP in the next few slides, but it's a processor built by Qualcomm, goes into uh, a bunch of cell phones. And uh, Pavel here works with uh, the compiler team as well as the other tools team, the assembler team, the linker team. Um, and we'll be talking about um, bringing up LVM and Linux on Hexagon. So, so what are we doing? We're essentially um, transitioning our users from GCC onto LLVM. And in doing that, uh, one of the things that our users really care about is, uh, like every user out there, is robustness. Right? So robustness of the compiler. Um, and if you look at GCC, it's extremely mature, as, as all of us know, and, that, and one of the big reasons for that is people have been hammering on GCC for years and years. So there have been thousands and thousands of hours uh, where GCC has been tested, all the obscure bugs that you get by just running wide code bases on a compiler have been uh, identified and fixed. So. As part of rolling out LLVM, one of the biggest challenges we have is how do we make it as mature? How do we approach that level of maturity, that level of robustness that GCC has? Um, GCC has. So one of our solutions, and this is, you know, we'll focus on this, but I, as, as background, uh, we of course do the, the standard things that a good compiler team should, which is we run hundreds of thousands of tests every night on the compiler to make sure that it passes. We, we look at our regression results, and we make sure that uh, we don't regress on robustness and correctness, on performance and code size, and all of those metrics. But one big solution for us to, to get to that level of maturity is to use the Linux kernel and user space as a big code base, which we run all our tools set through our LLVM compiler, through our downstream tools to make sure that we can identify any sort of correctness bugs, any corner cases that come up. And, and this talk will, will focus on that. So one thing I should have mentioned before starting, and I, I want to keep this very interactive. So if you have any questions, of course, feel free to ask. And um, we really want some feedback towards the end on, on what we're doing. All right, so from a pure selfish compiler perspective, right? one of the things that, that comes up very frequently is since Hexagon is a VLIW, a lot of the code paths in the compiler are not very well tested upstream. Right? The, the back end that we provide has very unique characteristics, which, which we really want to test very, very well. So, in rolling out LLVM to our customers, we really want to make sure that those code paths are tested uh, extensively. And uh, the, the other part of this is, um, I think some of you in this audience have experienced this, is when you have a bug on an embedded application, so our, our users do a lot of their testing, what we call on target, on hot hardware. If there's a bug, my team has literally spent weeks trying to figure out what the bug is. Because A, it's not immediately evident that the bug is a compiler bug. Right? It could be a variety of things. They're always moving components. There's the compiler that moves, the code base moves, the hardware moves. Right? And so when a crash occurs, there are 10 teams that get involved in trying to triage that crash. And we have spent weeks trying to figure out whether it's a compiler crash. And really, what keeps me awake at night, what, what's the worst case situation for a compiler, is the compiler is, is generating bad code. There's a, there's a code gen bug in the compiler. 
And when that happens, it's extremely difficult to ferret out that, that particular bug. So really, from my selfish compiler perspective, I want to make sure that we catch all of these bugs, we catch all of these code gen bugs before it's deployed. And that's part of doing this. And then sort of the other aspect of this, and this is where Powell will talk about uh, all these issues in depth, is our users are transitioning from GCC to LLVM. And let me try to, oh, okay. All right, so if there's one sentence which, for me, when I was listening to all of these talks, there's one sentence that um, summarizes all of these talks is that programmers code to compiler behavior. They don't code to C99. And this is not a ding on programmers, by the way. It's really when I'm programming, the tool that I have in front of me is the compiler. I don't go and read the C99 standard, thankfully. Um, so, so that really is one of the problems that we face when users are transitioning. They have coded, they have in their code bases a number of assumptions about how the compiler should behave. Uh, for instance, they, there might be code in there which has undefined behavior, but that undefined behavior is um, it's treated a certain way by GCC, which is not the same as, as client. So there are assumptions in the code, the GCC-isms that have crept in. And by doing this, by, by running Linux on Hexagon and all of Linux's user space, we want to identify all of those issues before the, before the customer sees it. So that's another aspect that is a big motivation for us to do this. All right, so a little bit about Hexagon. Just as, and I just, I'm curious, how many um, folks here have heard of Hexagon? Okay, that's, that's more than I thought, actually. So that's great. So Hexagon is... Yeah. Okay, right. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it's a start. Yeah, that's great. So, um, so yeah, so Hexagon is, is Qualcomm's digital signal processor. It's DSP, and it's part of the Snapdragon platform. So chances are that most of your cell phones have and Hexagon in it, and you're, you've used it, even though if you haven't heard of it, you've used Hexagon. Now, one of the interesting parts of this, and this really, as a compiler writer, this is the part that really excites me, of course, is that unlike traditional DSPs, Hexagon was designed to be programmed in C and C++. Um, and it's got sort of non-DSP features, it's got an MMU, it's, it's really meant to be more general purpose than your regular DSP. And as I said, we're we are transitioning from GCC. We had a GCC compiler, but we're moving to LLVM, and our customers have moved to LLVM. Now, the other part, aside from the, the general par purpose part um, that, that I really enjoy as a compiler writer is the VLIW architecture. So the onus of getting performance lies completely with the compiler. Right, it, there, there's no out of order execution, there's no runtime scheduler that can hide a lot of the compiler's flaws. So it's definitely on us to get a lot of the performance uh, for, for this architecture, so, that, so that's great. All right, so one of the things, of course, that, that we want to focus on is getting making sure that a compiler is correct, right? So, and if the, the, the primary goal for a compiler is to provide correct 
code generation. And you relax that particular requirement and then getting performance is extremely easy. Right? So one of the things we do is we have an elaborate set of internal tests. There's hundreds of thousands of tests that we run every night. But we want to stress test the compiler for correctness. And we have a section in the open questions about this. This is just the first step. Really, correctness is great, and, and that's what we are completely focused on. But we believe that we can use uh, the Linux kernel and use user space to, to guide our other compiler goals. And code size is something that we care a lot about in the embedded space. So that's something that we haven't gotten to, but we would love to hear um, feedback about how we can, we can do that by using the Linux user space or kernel. Now, we went through a release process about a month or so back. And before that, um, we discovered a lot of bugs that were not uncovered by our hundreds of thousands of tests. And this really, to me, provides a lot of value for doing this. This is exactly the reason why we did this. The, the code base is diverse enough that it helps us identify these kinds of issues. So this is really my last slide. Uh, Powell will take over after this. But I just wanted to give everybody a flavor of what Hexagon does. So this is an example packet that has been generated by the LLVM compiler. And it does a bunch of things. I'll just go through a few. It's doing a multiply accumulate. That's the, the first instruction that you see. And this is a packet, or if you're talking, if you're familiar with itanium, it's a bundle. It's a VLIW instruction. And uh, one of the, so, you know, while Powell brings it up, essentially what that packet was doing was doing a multiply accumulate followed by a couple of ads. And then the last instruction was a compare jump. But the interesting part about hexagon is it provides an interesting variant of com compare jump. It was comparing a value that was generated in the same packet with an immediate and deciding whether to jump or not based on that. So the reason why I brought it up is because it's, it's one of those things where, um, as a compiler writer, those kind of features are extremely exciting. Those are, kind, those are kind of features that you really want the compiler to generate correctly. The flip side of that is, because these are pretty complex, you, know, you have to put in VLIW-specific optimizations. And those are the ones that we want to stress test. And those are the ones that we want to uh, uncover bugs. OK, so I'll, um, I'll move over hey, to Pavel. Get this back up here. I can help you do that. So <laughs> hey, guys, I'm Pavel. I realize I'm the only thing that probably stands between you and lunch, so I'll try to be kind of succinct. Uh, so Anshu, basically, he's responsible for the compiler, right? So he hands me a compiler or hands me some Git repo that I pull the compiler from, I build it, and then he says, well, how good is my compiler? And the, the best thing that kind of summarizes what, what, what Anshu said, a really good test is can you build the kernel, can you build a root file system with the entire user space? And then does it run, and then can we quantify it? So I'll start with the kernel. So this is our hexagon arch kernel. Uh, we've kind of beat this already, this a little bit to death. It's global register variables. Uh, the, the hack that we had is just, an, you know, if LLVM is not defined. We use the regular global register variable syntax. If we are using LLVM, then you're actually going to have to write some assembly to pull out that register. This is on the read side. Um, so if you wanted to write, you'd have to write some. Uh, you have a writer and a getter. Um, if you're interested, uh, that link on the bottom LLVM uh, page does a good job of explaining all the extensions that are not implemented yet and all the extensions that will never be implemented. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is another interesting, uh, the, the kernel compared to user space, I'll talk about user space in a little bit, the kernel was much easier to build. Uh, this is interesting, the kernel, this, this is uh, sys, or, uh, this is driver's tty sysrq.c, it wants to for force a seg fault or a panic by de forcing the dereferencing of a null. We have the, uh, the killer pointer set to null and then it's just dereferenced right there. Uh, that's actually, dereferencing a null pointer is undefined behavior in C99. And when we were building this with LLVM, actually LLVM goes in and it sees you that you're dereferencing a null pointer and it puts in an abort call. And then it's, at link time you'll get, you know, you'll get an undefined symbol because there is no abort in the kernel. Uh, it's a trivial change here. We, th this is a little bit hacky. I think we could, we could have just made that pointer volatile and it would have achieved the same thing and we wouldn't need to write any inline assembly. 
Um, right, so move, moving on to user space, this is kind of the esoteric stuff that we've hit, and this is interesting. A lot of it comes from glibc. Um, so here's two, this, this isn't the code, obviously, from glibc. This is a much boiled down test case. But you can see this is called a global inline assembly. Um, just by show of hands, I'm just curious, how many, how many of you guys have you seen this kind of inline asm, but at file scope, not inside a function? So, okay. So we have that no op there. Where do you think that no op will actually go in the .s? Or is it, does the compiler guarantee? Are there any guarantees? No guarantees. Okay, so uh, that's what the code looks like. The no op goes in between the two functions. If you use GCC and you throw the F no top level reorder, you get guaranteed ordering that that no op will go in between the two functions. It will respect the ordering that it, you just saw previously. Uh, now let's take a look. So with LVM, LVM doesn't support that flag. It will throw a warning at you, but of course we're not, we're getting so many warnings are in this early stage that we're just kind of ignoring them. And it pulls this to the top. Okay, well, who cares? This is a no. Why would anybody ever do this, right? glibc does this. What it does in initfinny.c, it demarcates sections with inline asm like it. It says, hey, inline asm, begin some string, put some, some seek, some functions, and inline asm, end. And then a said file will come across, look for those demarcations, and build then a, a second file. Go ahead. Okay, good. Yeah, so we're on, we were doing this with 215. That is a great news that it's not doing this anymore. Um, and then, of course, our said scripts came along. It was all at the top. It parses. Then you get some very cryptic error at the end because you generated your three levels probably away from what the original bug actually happened. But that's great if that, that's changed. Um, yes, th this is another uh, interesting. So uh, this feature is called controlling names in assembler code. This, if you look at GCC, this is what they would call that. And all you do is in the, you have a function declaration there at the bottom, and you say asm, and then you give it a new name. Uh, so you can see function f1 is calling f2, and then we do this, this, uh, this, we add this attribute to the f2 declaration saying, hey, actually call it f3. So let's take a look at the, this is GCC code generation. So you can see there's function f1, we can see the global f1 there, and you can see it's a call to f3. So basically GCC just respected that attribute. So let's take a look at what LLVM does. LLVM still leaves the, the call to F2. It doesn't respect that asm. What's interesting, it doesn't, it only, it does not respect it only after that, if that attribute and declaration come after the usage of the call. If you put that declaration and, and attribute on top, it would respect it. But the problem is, I mean, you look at glibc, there's, there's, there's lots of macros. You, you, then you look at the .i file, and you'll see in the .i file, intermediate, after preprocessor runs, that you'll see this stuff all the time where you will have that as in declaration um, uh, after the call site. And this will break because later on uh, you're going to get a call to a function either that does not exist or the call to a function that you don't want to actually call. Um, yeah, th this is a very esoteric difference. I, I, I checked LVM 3.3, this still exists. Um, you can see we're echoing that that includes string to, to the actual compiler. And we're asking compiler, say, compiler, get, generate me a make file of the dependencies. Uh, so you can see, and, and then that, that, that uh, make file goes into foo.out, and we're just catting foo.out to see, to see what's in there. Now you, you can see, because this was echoed in through standard in, LLVM adds that standard in uh, Dependency, which is, it, it's pathological, right? It doesn't exist. So, but the problem is then you get later far down, you made all these uh, make files, you get farther down in the glibc build system, and you get some cryptic error that says standard in is an undefined dependency. And you go, and you automatically start thinking there's something wrong with standard in. So this took us a, li a little time to, to, um, to, to find and, and then uh, figure out. We, we need to ask for better laptops from Qualcomm. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have any questions, any comments while he's getting the... Well, I'll then... Go, go ahead. Um, 
Why are you guys compiling with Clang as opposed to GCC? What are you What do you guys hope to to accomplish? Um, Okay, so, <laughs> so there, there are a bunch of things. One is, I mean, this has been mentioned before, as, as a pure, you know, compiler deliverable, we find it much easier to add optimizations to Clang uh, versus GCC, right? So, so that's basically the driving part. Um, there are a bunch of other things as well. For instance, we are interested in link time optimizations. That's something that we care about. Now, GCC has LTO. And we've actually worked, with, worked on GCC in the past. But what we've seen is our customers are very fast-paced in that you know, they, will, they will, for instance, want a particular code size optimization implemented in a matter of months. And we've worked with them in the past on GCC, where we as a compiler team are much more flexible working with Clang. We can implement those optimizations months before we could do it in GCC. And that's, that's really the driving part for us moving to Clang as an organization. You know, TI has the 6x compiler, and we're going through, you know, do we, we have our own proprietary compiler, but um, we, we've done GCC port before. We're looking in the future, do we, we're not going to do a GCC port and an LLVM port, and the team is much more happy to get s completely spun up on expertise on LLVM. The, the, it's just a, if you're going to learn and become an expert on a code base now for a new architecture, it, it makes sense that it be LLVM. One other data point that was really interesting for me is we had an intern coming from the University of Edinburgh a few months back. And he was at Qualcomm Austin for about eight weeks. Within those eight weeks, now he, he's a smart guy, right? But within those eight weeks, he was able to contribute a code size optimization which shaved a huge amount, more than one megabyte, megabyte off of one of our primary targets. And the fact that he was able to do that, he didn't know anything about Hexagon before he came in. The fact that he's able to do that with LLVM is, to me, uh, a huge, huge plus. That's exactly the reason why we moved into LLVM. That would not have been possible with, with GCC, probably not with Open64 either. I was going to say, actually, just quickly, that's one of the things that, that we talk about in, um, in the talk that I do about the kernel, too, is licensing to, to certain organizations is very important. And the fact that they can implement an optimization or a, uh, uh, an extension that, that they can then use not only with LLVM and contribute upstream, but then they could also use in their own, dare I say it, proprietary code base is, is a plus, right? It means all of a sudden you can use the code in multiple places. And, and that's totally fair. I mean, the, the GCC develop so if, if, for example, and I'm not saying that this is our plan, but it, it might be one of them, if, if we have a version of LLVM that's completely open source for our architecture, but then we have one that adds one plug-in for, does a couple extra optimizations, and that becomes our proprietary compiler. Yes, I mean, if, if you, the GCC developers would focus on the bits that we're not sharing. I focus on the fact that the compiler team is not building their own front end anymore. They're not building their, the assembler that they build is open source, the, the, the linker. I mean, there's a whole bunch of that code base that they are contributing upstream, improving VLIW in, in, in the wild. Yeah. Oh yes, no, but, but please, I, I, I'm saying that it's, it's, it's a valuable thing. It means pe more people can contribute, and that's a, that's a very valuable thing. I mean, I, I, I very frequently run into this. I'm a, a Boost developer. I work with a lot of people who are doing big um, industrial C++ um, software, and we use a, a non-GPL license, um, not because we don't think the GPL is good, but because a lot of the people that um, we know in industry simply would not be able to, to use it at work. And it, it's, I think it's really good to have a license for, for something like Clang where it can be used at work. 
So. Not that everybody needs uh, that situation, but yeah, in some situations, licenses preclude it's being used in certain situations. Uh, and before we wanted, so this is our conclusion that, that it, running a through, if you have a compiler team or you have a kernel team and you did your import, the best way to make sure that, that your product is good is build the kernel, r uh, run as many, uh, build as many user space packages as possible and see what breaks. So this kind of leads to the last, I have, we have a uh, question to the community in general. Um, Anshu, if you can go to the next uh, slide. Is, is, how, how do we quantify the quality of our linker, compiler, assembler, kernel port, and our user space? Uh, and wh what I mean by quality is correctness, build time, binary size, execution time. Uh, how do we capture those results, archive them, and then analyze them? And I don't really, I don't know if there's any open source project that aims to tackle that. And I'm just so, so a way to compare uh, the outputs of two different compilers in, a, in an objective fashion, sort it, of idea? Absolutely, even two compilers. Let, let, let's or say regression? A, it, it, exactly. Let's say it doesn't even have to be two different compilers. Uh, I want to throw fno inline. Well, what does that do to my, to, to my execution time? I don't, we don't have an intelligent, not, I don't know if that we have an intelligent way to do those comparisons on, on a macro scale. What I see is most people, they will, they will have a set of five or six benchmarks that they run, and if those are good, hey, thumbs up, ship it. I know that uh, Michael Hope had a whole mess of those at, uh, when he was leading the compiler team at Lenaro. He might be, I don't know what he did with them, but he might be open to, Michael to Hope. sharing. Yeah. Okay. He's at Google now, but I mean, he's out there. Okay. Thank you. That sounds like useful for everybody. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, did you guys consider running through the GCC test suite? Because uh, it will give you everything. Uh, you, you, you make check? Yeah, I mean, I mean because, because you want to get more test coverage by running the kernel, if you just go through this hundreds of thousands GCC tests and tests, with it will uncover you all the problems that you found in the kernel, but on a much smaller scale. Yeah, so that, that's a good question. We don't run the, well, I don't, you can maybe answer that, but what we do is we definitely, we found that the glibc, the C library make check is the most exhaustive kernel test. Uh, that you can do. There's lots of tests and they're all pretty brutal, testing very rudimentary functionality. So we do glibc make check, we do busybox make check, we do like tar bash make. Uh, but the problem is even, even if we could get these results back, which we do from all these different packages make checks, there's no standard way for them to feed that information back into some kind of database or some kind of archival engine. And then how do you view that information and how do you actually display maybe graphs if there was a standard way for all these packages, when you build them, where you run make check on them, to feed information back into the system, archive it, and then display it. So j just to add to what Paul said, we have run the GCC torture test um, on Clang. And you know, it, we run into the same problems, that we need a way to, we can run it once, and then somebody can spend a few weeks looking at, OK, this is a GCCism. We don't need to do this. But we run into the same problems, which is structurally, what I would ideally want is to run it automatically every week and get these macro level details on, okay, this has regressed, this hasn't. And we run into the same problem. So we really need a solution for that. That's the key problem that we face. Thanks. So it is what we are trying to achieve in Debian, but it takes a lot of time to set up everything, especially since there are so many automatic testing suits and so on that you have to get output from them and export them. So there is one stuff which is quite interesting. It's a firehose format done by the guys from Fedora, which is basically a way to store results from test suite. So it's a very good format, and we are writing a lot of export to that. So we have Coxinel, which is used in the Linux kernel. We have Finebugs, and we have plenty of other exporters. And in what we are trying to do in Debian is the build time, we've got it. The code size, we've got it. The execution time also. The correctness, it depends if the tests are launched or not by the package. So things are improving. And the folk in Ubuntu are also doing the same in Debian and in Ubuntu. So in a couple of years, I think we will have everything ready. But for now, we are only doing it that on the architecture that we are supporting in Debian. And the proof of concept is only on AMD64. So for 
So if you want to get involved, you, you will have to provide some resources, uh, I mean computing resources, but uh, we could discuss on that. Yeah, we're, kind of, we're just doing some homegrown stuff right now, but it seems like that there's a gap in general in the open source community for this. Because, I mean, Red Hat has to do Anybody that's interested in creating a distro has to have a way of, of, of quantifying how good is my distro. Yeah, but it's too hard for distro to uh, have any idea of the performances of the binaries that you're generating. Nobody's doing that currently. But, right, it, my argument is that the package maintainers are the best ones that know which metrics should be fed back into. If we, they had an API that would feed information back. Just, just a couple things. I, um, so, Lenaro has Lava, and it's getting, so they use Lava to test GCC regressions, and that's getting a lot more attention in the past year. Um, and the dashboard's getting better about representing, you know, trends over time and things like that. I don't think it's completely there to what you want, but um, you can look at it. And then, wow. Yocto Project is, and, you know, if you're really looking at building a proprietary architecture distro, um, you know, Yocto project is, you know, makes a lot more sense than, you know, trying to get Hexagon into Debian or something like that, right? Um, so, Yocto project's starting to look at this, and, and we're looking at what test infrastructure we would use going forward. So, it might be a, an intersection point for you. Okay, great. All right, any other questions? Yeah, you guys want to talk to Tyler Baker for Lava. Tyler Baker, okay. It wouldn't be a bad, because it's the nice thing about it, it's fairly extensible. You can install it on a, you can install it on a, yourself, and it's got a whole host of things to do just this, just, just what you're, to collect data in the way that, and present it in just the way that you're talking about. All right, we're actually in a situation that's a bit odd. It turns out that um, it wasn't clear on the schedule, but we were supposed to take a break between 10 and 10.30. So, in fact, we are half an hour early to lunch. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we, we have the option of, of talking a bit longer or breaking early. Are, are there any other...